just because I was seeking the right things, the right things appeared at the right time. Like uh, I found uh, a community of like Gnostics I had never seen before that are like super advanced and they're on YouTube and they have a whole massive library of information, uh, like advanced information I've never seen before. And um, they're specifically talking about this whole map and, and uh, pranayama and uh, white tantra and just abstinence, re renouncing, um, giving in to lower desires, essentially. And just des like desiring the one thing that's really worth desiring. Like training your will on God, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea always kind of has been in the occult that you're only the only operation that is legal is um, the uh, knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel or accessing the higher genius. Any other operation tends to become black magic. And it's definitely true that any kind of deviation from your single purpose generally turns out badly. And as long as you yeah. stay single-mindedly focused on it, I mean, and, and really one of the reasons that it's such a powerful approach to things is that your focus narrows. So there aren't all of these, there's not all this information and all these things. It's just the, the one thing that you're focused on. So you're, concentration becomes more like a laser beam than just sort of like a frequency sweep or something, you know? Yeah. And it seems like the higher you go, the like, lower you fall to, like as you train your, your will and your energy in this direction, then if you go off that path, like you said, it, everything verges on black magic or however you want to put it. I think that's a good way to put it. And the higher you go in the right direction, if you actually step off, that's a lot of like potential energy that's going to be thrown off into the wrong direction that you've been building up. Yep. That's Cause it's like all about, I think it's all about like sublimating or transmuting. That's like, those are like essentially the same word energy instead of going towards the lower desires of ignorance, essentially you're transmuting that energy into gnosis yeah, that's the fundamental process of the entire universe, I think. I mean, that's basically like, th there there was this guru in the United States, supposedly, that was thrown out of the country for teaching one sentence. And he, uh, a friend of mine that used to sing for this band called Ugly Kid Joe, that <laughs> had like one hit in the mid-90s or something, he... Um, he said his friend was like, you got to go see this guru. And he's like, no, I don't, I'm not into gurus. But he said, dog, just go. I'll pay for it. And he goes in and he's expecting like this Indian guy with a big long beard and everything. And this like scrawny, nerdy white guy walks in and sits down <laughs> behind the desk and he starts like writing. And then like 10 minutes go by and then 15 minutes go by and this dude hasn't said a word. He's just like writing on paper. And finally he looks up and like looks around the room and he's like, okay, I'll take your questions now. And somebody raises their hand and he's like, okay, you. And this woman's like, yeah, my, I lost my job. My husband cheated on me. All this, you know, my credit cards got stolen, blah, 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 all this stuff. Why is this happening to me? And he said, the problem is that there's one thing doing one thing. And you think there are all these things doing all these things. One thing doing one thing. Next person and the other guy is like, yeah, my wife's a whore. My dog's dead and my truck blew up and I lost my job. And he's like, there's, problem is that there's one thing doing one thing and you think there are all these things doing all these things. And when I first heard the story, I thought like, well, it's just the same line that those guru types always give people. It's all one, you know, but there's something about how he phrased it. It's all one thing doing one thing that really kind of, you know, once it's planted in your brain, it starts kind of developing of its own accord, I think. And um, that idea <clears throat> that it doesn't come from the Kabbalah because like this, I came to this idea through reason or something, I don't know, subconscious reasoning or whatever, but the idea that light crystallizes into matter and then is redintegrated into its former state. 
uh, as light again is the alchemical process in a nutshell. And so if this idea that it's one thing doing one thing and everything is an as above, so below um, reflection of this original process, I mean, even the Fibonacci sequence demonstrates it by going forward, going back and copying, and going forward again and going back and copying. Um, it's, uh, yeah. One thing doing one thing. Yeah, that uh, sounds very similar to the Occam's razor thing I was talking about. The simplest explanation is, well, I guess maybe I didn't finish that thought, though, which is just that we're doing the same thing, basically. You know, the alchemical process of that transmutation and sublimation that you were talking about. It's, yeah, there's one one thing fund fundamentally going on. Yeah, and everything is just sort of like a, a replication of that in many And another way of saying is there's a teleology to existence. It's purpose striving. Mm -hmm. Existence has a singular purpose, and we're discovering that singular purpose. Systole and diastole, expansion and contraction, is another um, another variation on that one thing that it's doing that I've heard that, that kind of makes sense. Because it, you know, it also starts as like this. We're told this tiny little singularity that expands and expands and expands. And then if um, the quantum loop theory uh, is correct, then at some point the process reverses, or you know, if Hockney at all is correct, I mean, they say this as well, that the, the process reaches a certain point and then reverses. And so systole and diastole, the same way that our lungs breathe, and you know, it, it, humans attempt to do it, I think, because we become more like a baby if we are able to grow very old. You know, it's like you can see that process of reversing and returning to the starting point, but the body doesn't have quite the capacity to actually shrink back down to the size of an egg. <laughs> it wants to, you know, it's doing the same thing. It's not, it's not about, um, I don't know, like I just why are we changing the law of necessity to the principle of sufficient reason? Like it just kind of implies that these are like his ideas when they're definitely not. And the idea that everything came from nothing also is Leibniz and Crowley and all these older Illuminatuses. And so it just seems like he's doing the exact same thing to Pythagoras and Leibniz and Crowley and all of these other people that Morg did to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the same well, thing. It's just and there's a couple of things. Um, Hockney isn't one person. Yeah, it's at least three people in the original authors. They say they they said that it was at least three people writing under Hockney, and and there's a lot of other writers. And there's a lot of other pseudonym authors. And um, I have a question. Uh, where do you get the idea that Leibniz is a Illuminatus other than Hockney and them? Well, did, did you ever find anything about that? Well, you, you have to understand what my um, definition of that is. And it's not, it's not even necessarily... Uh, I'm I'm almost 100% sure Leibniz was at least a Mason. I I haven't double checked that, but there's there is a line in Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma that many Masons have never stepped foot into a um, lodge. Lodge, right? And so it's like but I that's, I received that's going into like the idea that anyone can self initiate into Illuminism from any background and they don't need any authority. I yeah. think that's probably the more correct way because it is like the one true religion of light, essentially. That's exactly that's the idea of it. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. And so, I don't know. I mean, I kind of like, I, I, I hedge on whether or not tradition matters or like giving people credit or whatever, but I tend to like, I don't, I, you know, I don't, unless we have a new idea, we don't really need to change any names to something that suggests, um, you know, that we did it ourselves or something. I don't know. Um, 
But yeah, that's so, been, that's wait, been... I, I haven't I haven't just thought of something else. Um I don't know how what percentage confident you are, but I've heard you mention it's possible your uh, your lineage goes back to Isaac Newton. Uh right? Mm hmm. Was it also like reincarnation based or just lineage? No, no. And I guess there's some serious doubt thrown into that unless it's just by um um, like some other, cause he, they say he was a virgin. I don't know if I believe it, but they say he died a virgin. So if that's true, then it's, it's not really possible that I'm a descendant of his. And the reason I thought that is that my mother had our ancestry done and that was her, she said, uh, you know, one of your descendants is Sir Isaac Newton, but I think that could have meant like by you know on his mom's side or something and not necessarily like a direct descendant from him which is not how i understood it as a child um mm -hmm. either way though it's pretty fucking weird it was weird for me to have grown up with that idea in my head and then discovered that he was actually uh, that he had like rooms full of all this stuff that i was obsessed with you know that's an awfully weird coincidence to like you know what's also a weird coincidence I just learned about mm. my lineage? <clears throat> my last name is Hebert. It's a French last name. And I recently was watching a video about the French Revolution. And the second most rebellious group, if not the most radical group of rebels in the French Revolution, next to the Jacobins, was the Hebertists. And it was led by Jacques Hébert. And they converted 2,000 churches, including Notre Dame, into churches of reason. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying about this stuff, man. There's definitely some weird, like, um, some of us, it just bubbles up out of nowhere. You know, you do it. I've watched you do it. You know, you do it to a degree that is more advanced than the overwhelming majority of people. And you also took less psychedelics than the overwhelming majority of those people that do it better than the overwhelming majority. So the idea that you would have some kind of lineal thing happening with that is not surprising, really. Yeah, but if you are connected to uh, Newton... You know, they were, he was kind of a nemesis of Leibniz. They were kind of enemies of each other, each other rivals. Uh -huh. And Hockney, they say Leibniz was the greatest grandmaster of the Illuminati. And the first, the, the guy who was the grandmaster of the Illuminati at the time walked up to meet Leibniz at like a get together. And he said he nearly fainted because he realized he was the reincarnation of Pythagoras himself and the overwhelming brilliance that he was exuding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, you know, it's a weird, weird thing that, uh, Leibniz, you know, I knew what his, his monad idea, somebody asked me one time years and years ago and I explained it all and I'd never read it. And I also knew that all this stuff that I was figuring out was what would be classified as Illuminati secrets. But until you know, when I found all these other ideas being presented as Illuminati stuff by Hockney at all, um, I don't know, it's just, you know, it's kind of difficult to explain that, you know, without invoking some sort of preternatural something, you know. I feel like your memory is a little bit better than mine in, in some ways. Uh, I don't know why. I feel like maybe of uh, the way my cognition works at the moment, uh, and growing up, it's kind of been to block out certain things, kind of pushing it off and trying to learn it the hard way again, even though like I know this stuff intuitively, it's like I'm pushing it off to like find a new path to it somehow. I feel like that was kind of part of my progress up until now. Now it's just like naturally just erupting from within and falling together like all the pieces I've, I've collected throughout my life. Yeah, well, it sounds like you had the um, better of the two possible outcomes from your Saturn return. What does that mean? Lifts you up like a child full of light and innocence or drags you down like a stone. Um, you know, you know the Saturn return and all that, right? Or no? No. 
Uh, 10,000 days is a year on Saturn, roughly, so 27 years. That's why Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, um, Jim Morrison. I knew it. I knew there was something important with 27 years. In 20, like when I was turning 28, I was like, okay, I don't know what it is. I was telling everybody for like the previous year, like something is transitioning. I don't know what it is. And it's big. It's literally like my life is changing forever. And like this year. Yeah. That song, um, the grudge by a tool is about, is about this. And then 10,000 days is also kind of an extension of that. Cause his mother was paralyzed for like a Saturn return. So, um, but yeah, so it goes one of two ways. Either you have some sort of um, fundamental transformative experience and it goes, you know, good. Or you end up, I was in prison when I turned 27. And if mm. I hadn't been, I might have been dead, you know, because I was just completely going out of control. So. <clears throat> well, um what were we, what were we also we, i think we left one loop open there i wouldn't be surprised when we were talking about Leibniz. So. oh yeah um yeah i don't know it was just it was just the idea that you know you were asking me like why did i think he was an illuminatus or whatever and it's just like you just you know the the ideas and stuff are that kind of thing i don't know how to say it like you just kind of know it when you see it i guess like that real recognizes real thing people say or <laughs> whatever you know i mean you know this stuff when you see it if you know what it is you know so i didn't need to hear that he was a illuminatus from anyone to just detect it in the ideas and stuff you know so um another person that they claim these authors claim was a illuminati grandmaster but unofficial because the first official illuminati grandmaster was pythagoras according to them yeah the first unofficial grandmaster can you guess who it was no according to them king solomon oh yeah well that's a of course that's a, a candidate but then i mean there's no evidence that he actually ever and lived. i mean human history goes way back before recorded history well, it's definitely not true that Pythagoras is the first Illuminati Grandmaster. 100% it's not true because he went to Egypt and or Babylonia, Syria, to study the mysteries and then brought it to Greece. So he may be the beginning like the of... the first of, that, of like the ontological mathematical kind of Illuminati. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. This yeah. lineage that you could maybe draw back to Pythagoras, that's who I would that's you know that's where that's where we know the trail goes cold there for sure nobody knows anything beyond that um but they did also um uh, find the pythagorean theorem etched into cuneiform tablets in ancient babylonia two weeks ago so the whole connection between pythagoras and pythagoras's ideas and those places has now been physically proven and there's a lot of other theorems and stuff um, that have been discovered in the same way that they were just attributing to the Greeks, but it goes back to ba Babylonia and probably before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just that one. Um, there's a really interesting math professor, trigonometry professor online who uh, studies, uh, translate Babylonian texts and ba Babylonian trigonometry. And he kind of made a, a different version of trigonometry based on first principles. And that's a really inter interesting rabbit hole to go in. That's a really good YouTube channel. And he's even like trying to rewrite music theory in a more mathematical way. Yeah, I mean, it's already written itself. Someone just has to um, figure out how to transcribe it correctly, basically from the ether <laughs> or whatever, you know. I mean, Pythagoras did an okay job of giving us giving us the rudiments. I guess they've had to tweak it a little bit since then, from what I understand. But more or less, yeah. But definitely, Illuminism goes back to Egypt, like ancient Egypt and whatever was before that. 
I guess as long as there was conscious human beings, there have been a minority of Illuminists popping in and out of humanity. Yeah, well, there's the official... Um, well, not the official story. Let's see. How would you... Uh, I mean, okay, so we have kind of a consensus that we're going back to Pythagoras as like the uh, progenitor of the Western mysteries, uh, the Scottish Rite Freemasonry and the Illuminati and the OTO and all of that sort of stuff kind of grew out of out of Pythagoras. And then there are stories that he journeyed to uh, Egypt and that Egypt received them from Babylonia and whatnot. And then I had sort of one of those visionary experiences where I was informed that Thoth, the Atlantean, wasn't really an Atlantean. Uh, Thoth was a, a star tribe entity, basically, uh, that wasn't actually physically here. And I'm not sure if that happens in holographic form, um, but a couple of weeks ago I was thinking about this, and my intuition is that a hol hologram that is created by light-based technology would be way easier to um, send through time than a physical person. So if there are communications from the future, that would explain by my, why myself and a lot of other people have described these beings as sort of being translucent and almost not even there. Um, and that he was the one that actually taught all that stuff to the Babylonians and then in the Kabbalion, it says the same thing. But I received that out of, you know, wherever, the subconscious or the universal mind or my imagination, whatever it was, years and years and years before I ever saw that in the Kabbalion. So I've, to some extent, kind of taken that as some type of truth, you know, that Thoth may have actually been a real person and the original, uh, you know, father of the mysteries. And then the, another interesting aspect of this um, story is that Syrian Ru and Acacia would be both, would be available, or, you know, they, it's in, in, is the word endemic? Or, um, yeah. Oh, um, I know what you're trying to say, yeah. Um, not in, in, in dodge, whatever, yeah. You in, know, it's, indigenous. No, indigenous is people, endogenous is things. So it's uh, something endogenous. endemic, I think, is a word that works for that. I don't know, whatever. Okay. It comes from both <laughs> places. So it's like, I, I, I think that the reason that the acacia leaves are buried with 33rd degree Freemasons to this day has to do with the fact that the Apoptia, the inner circle knowledge, um, in both the Egyptian, the ancient, ancient Egyptian mysteries and the Greek mysteries and Pythagoras, uh, because, you know, the, the other Greek mysteries that we know more about, the Eleusinian mysteries, uh, they did have this this drink and then the Apoptia, the inner circle, where um, people that had, like, true initiation were allowed to consume. Um, that was, like, the big heavily guarded secret, that there was this psychoactive drink that would give you, permit entrance into the halls of Amenti and the, you know, knowledge of the gods and all of that sort of stuff. And it even seems that it could go all the way back to uh, the Garden of Eden story because we have this weird um, admonition not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then you will know as Elohim, which is some sort of group of star beings, again, you know, and that's also connects it back to this Thoth being a star tribe person because this plant is guarded by these Elohim, which is a masculine form of a f feminine plural. So it's more like an androgynous group or something. Um, but uh, at any rate, you know, it seems to have come from the heavens, whatever this Elohim is. And if relative to a human, it was a god. And it's telling them not to consume the plant that is the gateway to the mysteries, even in the Garden of Eden. So all of this seems to potentially add up. Um, pretty well I guess uh, and then you know yeah. if you look at the fact that our society has demonized the Illuminati you know the media and the propaganda machine has demonized the Illuminati and the Freemasons and um, all of this stuff 
that is basically all about uh, self-awareness and knowledge and um, flow state, which is the enemy of the mind forge manacles of the matrix. You know, um, the demonization of psychedelic plants is kind of central to that. Uh, so mm -hmm. All pretty wild. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily physical alien beings in the universe doing something. And I'm not convinced that it's possible to communicate from future to past or from past to future. Right. Um, so an alternative explanation is that it's connected to that whole astral plane dimension not dimension, but you know what I mean, that we were talking about, that there's some sort of non-local way of connecting. or Yeah, and mystery initiates have uh, a name for it, um, as, as do the Zulu somehow, and uh, why the Zulu have a word that is um, the same as the Hebrew word and means the same thing is just completely bizarre. But Merkaba, the chariot of light, uh, the idea basically is that if you're going to zip around the universe, um, the only way to do it sensibly is light because light moves at or the fastest possible speed. And when you're moving at the speed of light, uh, there's no time. So from your point of view, it would be like teleportation. Uh, so if you could consciously formulate the body of light is the, the practice, you know, it's in a lot of Aleister Crowley's magical instruction books, how to practice formulating the body of light and going out on the astral plane. And then one of the prerequisites for doing this with um, competence, I guess, and gathering information uh, is a very profound knowledge of symbolism um, and this is one of the reasons for um, uh, the, the transmitting lineage uh, initiation uh, directly to make sure that these things actually get communicated properly. But the l symbols, the idea is that on the astral plane, symbols are alive, they're living beings. They're, their functionality is uh, actual instead of interpretive as it is here, you know. When we compress a bunch of information into a symbol and we look at the symbol, we, you know, know what it means, but there's nothing, it, it doesn't do anything. And so that's kind of reversed on the astral plane. And so uh, knowledge, profound knowledge of all these symbols is supposed to be really important to acquire. Kind of like activates it. Yeah. So you're, you're supposed to have a really good knowledge and, um, that's, you know, well, one of the things that makes people suspicious about mystery traditions with all the secrecy is that they're afraid that um, it, it's because they're hiding something. But in reality, a lot of it is just protecting people from themselves and not spoiling their development by putting ideas in their head before they develop there organically. Um, but this idea of, you know, an initiatory system um, to, as like a safeguard... Uh, is something that you know people people just assume the worst i guess about the secrecy when in fact it's actually totally helpful and benevolent so i don't know what alistair crowley has said about developing that light self or the astral self but that seems that's very similar to the conclusions i've been arriving at um and that's why I'm a lot more interested in pranayama and white tantra and uh, active imagination, lucid dreaming, and astral projection slash out of body experience triggering and ex uh, activity and doing it in an intentional, like a purposeful manner for that purpose. So I can actually develop my consciousness to the next level. I think that is the next level. Yeah, I mean, that astral travel definitely, um, I, I, I think that you're 
correct about that. And, and that's, I think, getting into somewhat dangerous territory because if I'm right about how um, things work in the universe, then when you're out in the field, there's just naturally a lower level of coherence. Uh, speaking of the uh, law of necessity, uh, the reason we have so much magnetite in our heads is because it, it gives coherence and structure, a dense point, in the same way that between the nothingness on the subatomic uh, realm, there are little bundles of energy. You know, it's, it's, it's like that. And so we wouldn't have physical bodies if we didn't need them. Uh, conscious beings, highly conscious beings, need a physical body to give density to the field, to give it a point of awareness. Can you close the door? Yeah. Stop making it creak. Um, so if you're, you know, expand, we were talking about systole and diastole earlier. If you're going out into the field, there's this expansion. And then if you don't return in a, you know, due order and reformulate yourself, then you might acquire some of that psychosis that is, uh, one of the, yeah. you know, this is a real danger in the occult of like, it's not for the reasons think, that, um, that people think, but it's not untrue that you can have issues. This is my intuition about that right now. I think this, uh, the being alive as a physical being is kind of a training uh, platform for that next step. Things are a lot easier. You can get away with a lot more, a lot more. And that's part of like, there's just, there's so much more incoherence on this level. But once you get to that next level, um, thought, like you said, just kind of creates reality. So what, what you bring to the table is going to be fed back to you tenfold what it's fed back to you on the physical plane, so to speak. And that's probably the mechanism that drives people crazy if they're not properly trained and prepared and serious and on the right intentionality and stuff like that. And possibly other things would be training or understanding of symbolism in the right way and having an open mind, open to intu intuition, not dogmatic, uh, being intelligent as fuck. Well, and su success in anything can lead to ego inflation. That that also, you know, I mean, it even happened to me, even though I went into it, you know, fully armed, knowing that ego inflation is the enemy. Don't let that happen. And then, you know, the devil is awfully sneaky and still managed to, to, to do that. Um, so, you know, and because you also, you know that you're acquiring power. And luckily, in my case, I had an aversion to abusing power because it really could have gotten ugly if I didn't, you know. I, I totally understand how things like Charles Manson happen, <laughs> you know. Um, well, do you think the right path is based on that to be oriented to just benevolence, omni-benevolence and compassion and helping all instead of an egoic power structure. I think it's kind of two paths. You can be like selfish or you can be compassionate. Yeah, it's the right right hand path and the, and the left hand path. And then the yellow path, they say, is not really an option anymore. And someone asked me a little while ago, why is it called the yellow path? Because it's black and white, shouldn't it be gray in the middle? It's because it's the path of cowards, you know, shit or get off the pot. You can't decide whether you're good or evil. Like, what is your deal? <laughs> you know, so the yellow, <laughs> the yellow way is the coward's path. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's not necessarily the yellow way or the middle path so much as like, um, you know, it's almost like communism versus capitalism or something. Hybrid systems are always more effective and preferable to pure systems. No one has ever even tried pure socialism, I don't think. And when you get too close to it, it definitely does not work. So I, th I think that's kind of what it, the, the realistic position to take is that, you know, completely disowning your own or disavowing, disavailing, disavowing yourself of of any yeah like uh, complete selflessness or yeah, complete selfishness both are wrong that's not the point yeah yeah exactly it's um it's about mediating and integrating those things to 
I mean, yeah. it's the it's the one thing doing the one thing is that's the pr- proper frame, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you can't really separate individual interest from from collective interest either, which is something that we've kind of been, I think, indoctrinated to not believe. You know, um, people are really afraid. Uh, a lot of people in capitalist societies of anything that sounds like a communist or socialist kind of attitude, you know? So yeah. it's funny too, to watch how blind people are because, you know, you'll, you'll hear these people talk about how the streets are full of homeless people and, you know, it's starving people and all this shit in these socialist countries and whatever. And then you drive through San Francisco and there are homeless encampments that stretch for 15 miles and you know you're wading through garbage and human excrement and it's like huh that's odd and then you zoom over to china and everything's clean and people have health care and they're all this like um <laughs> is are, are are we did something happen did you guys all like get a hit on the head or like what uh, or you look at the metric in Norway, which brings us back to the idea, or, or Holland's a better example, I guess, or not the metric, but you look at the, the populace in Norway with the metric of happiness, and you, know, you have a socialist, um, democratic socialism, and they score the highest, uh, Norway and Holland, um, D- despite their socialist tendencies, you know. So I think uh, part of the weird thing about enlightenment and illumination is that it's right there our whole lives. The obvious truth is there. And, you know, both of us can probably lay claim to having made a lot of progress, but you'll still notice almost, uh, you know, for me on a nearly daily basis, these like really obvious things that are eluding everyone, you know, like that example of how it, when you do mediate, the self-interest and the collective interest, the you become number one and number two on the happiness metric. And yet you still have all these slumbering fools in the United States that think they're the greatest in the world, even though they rank 30 and below on every meaningful metric besides military spending and prison population. So... <laughs> discovering truths that are not super intuitive. Um, well, they are intuitive. That's the thing. Yeah, you can't are. say that. <laughs> Our brainwashing yeah. is what's not intuitive. Yeah. The authors say, basically, Illuminism was most concentrated, I guess you could say, in, uh they, they give like a lineage in different books. It's usually like uh, Egypt's on the list, usually uh, Solomon, the Phoenicians, Orphism, Pythagoreans, uh, Plato was a, apparently part of Pythagoras' school and then got kicked out because he couldn't keep secrets. And then like Neoplatonism later and Gnosticism. And then the Dark Ages happened. And then you get like Cathars, um, Knights Templar, Jesuit priests, uh, original Freemasons and Rosicrucians, and Illuminati, and and I guess some like Eastern traditions could qualify as like Illuminists, but they're heavily based on mythos and intuition and not logos, which is like the Pythagorean route going to mathematics. Like Jainism, they say, is very compatible with Illuminism, modern Illuminism, in a lot of ways, more deeply than even Hinduism. Yeah, well, the main distinction should be that it's not like dogma and doctrine that you have to learn and and study and understand in that way, so much as it's a set of processes that catalyze organic experiences, internal experiences that yield certain knowledge. So, you know, in a lot of those systems that you named, the people that were illuminists within those ranks are people that escaped the religions, <laughs> really, because, you know, it's, it's, that's the thing about it that sets it apart from everything else, is that there's, um, 
a great degree of critical thinking that is required on the part of any Illuminatus that's going to make it past the early stages without losing his mind. And, you know, it's a process of, of reason, you know, intuitive reasoning and, and an a individually centered process of gnosis rather than, you know, absorption of dogma and, and, and uh, scriptures and stuff, you know what I mean? So, like, that's, that's really the, the, uh, the important part of it, you know, I think. And I even have some qualms that there's any kind of writings at all, you know, because the only purpose that they should serve is to confirm for the uh, Illuminatus that this has happened to other people. And for the most part, they should not be given these writings until after they've had the initiations on their own. The only exception to that should be that there are certain things that can be told to a person and certain processes they can undergo that can catalyze these. Um, because, you know, if you read something in a book and then you come to that conclusion or you have an experience, you don't really know if it's just because it was in the book or not, you know. So that's, it's a confusing thing because on the one hand, like I do it too, you know, I, I feel like getting the information out and just making it available to people is an important part of the process. But then I also wonder if maybe we're not all violating the secrecy foolishly and wasting our time too. Because generally if the fertile ground hasn't been prepared for the aspirant to, you know, really have this internal process of gnosis themselves, they're not going to understand any of it anyways. So it's like you're just preaching to the choir or you're wasting your time throwing pearls before swine. There really isn't any middle ground. Maybe if there is a middle ground, it would be uh, communicating through mythos, communicating through stories, and not, not in the way of like creating new dogmatic religions that oppress people's minds and development. But like the hero's journey archetype is fundamental to the process and stories that are great representations of that can activate certain things in a psyche that are you know, necessary for the development. <clears throat> I think embodying, embodying the hero archetype is essentially it, just part of like the program that you can follow. It's just naturally a part of life that leads towards the ultimate conclusion that we're aiming for. Yeah, and the, really the biggest problem is context because you know so many people are coming from um, a place of having been prepared by the um, cultural uh, influences. You know, they've been they've, they're coming from this framework of take a myth literally and that's your religion and if that one doesn't suit you then believe another one literally and so well maybe it's maybe that is just just a a product of um where humanity has come from that it hasn't completely gotten rid it needs to get rid dialectically get rid of these systems through evolution but um, where we came from as humanity, we were highly suggestible uh, through our right brains, what our right brains communicated to us, or that's just one way of putting it, like the voices of the gods, we just were like our the voices and manifestations in our head were much more hallucinatory, probably, and we... I mean, it's probably just still the norm for humans to just be that suggestible as they develop. You have to develop the neocortex fully and use it correctly and in like a hero's journey manner to break out of the the Plato's cave and go into the sunlight to become a, a luminist. Yeah, yeah. And it's just an interesting circumstance that we have people that are the opposite of the Illuminati that are putting all this pressure on society not to do that. <laughs> and, you know, I, a lot of people in our 
side of things kind of hate them, but I think the reality is that without that pressure, they're no. Oh. Okay. So uh, I stopped what I was doing, and I just started uh, sinking into it, and I felt uh, vibrations going through my body, and then I decided to start doing active imagination, which I haven't haven't done in a long time, and. I was having some interesting experiences, vivid experiences just with that. And then uh, uh, some sort of realization happened. And then I uh, experienced white light emerging from like every point of my awareness, like vividly in like every dimension. And the experience of it being like identical to all of existence and myself and um then i had a flicker of an image of the ayahuasca spirit that i was experiencing on my second trip and this seemed to be like where it was trying to lead me because you remember i was telling you it felt like it wanted to show me a little bit more like i needed to go back to ayahuasca and this seemed to be like the experience that that part of me wanted to want me to see consciously well, and one, I had, uh, yeah. one interesting possibility there is that there is a practice when you're preparing for, I mean, you might know about this already, but the um, practice of preparing for the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram where you expand until you merge with the Godhead, which is pretty much exactly what you were saying, like a white light that's extended to the entirety of existence. So that is like a, you know, magical practice that people do yeah and then i uh, i had a conversation with that math guru teacher the next day and i brought it up to him and he was saying he has a pretty advanced teacher and i don't know much about him but from what he was he's pretty advanced and so his teacher is definitely more advanced than he is even and he was saying that's kind of where he's trying to go every single day and he said there's a place even more advanced or deep than that and it was just pure golden light well i feel like once i rose above all of the lights <clears throat> and then it's the absolute nothingness and i think that's probably i mean it has to be the end of the road or the beginning of the road or both or whatever you know what i mean but it, yeah it, i don't so then I was kind of asking and inquiring, like, there's got to be some sort of map. There's cartographers of this kind of experiential space from out his from throughout history and different disciplines and traditions. And I was kind of searching online for answers on the, in that dimension and asking him. And he was kind of describing to me kind of what I was intuiting and piecing together from what I was finding online that there seems to be a there's levels to it. I mean, this kind of even mirrors like the Kabbalah and stuff that there are like, um, loose, like um, maybe active imagination could qualify as a step on a lower step on the ladder from like normal waking consciousness. And then, lucid dreaming above that and then astral uh travel out of body experience type stuff and then like pure white light kind of gold light kind of stuff even higher than that and there seem does that does that make any sense to you yeah and then beyond that there's the three layers of progressive nothingness until there's absolute nothingness so it's like ein sof ein sof hour and ein ein I don't I it might just be ein, but it's like just progressively lesser nothing that like the outer layer is basically the kind of light that we interact with, but maybe just like more in its like consciousness form or something. And then a layer beyond that where the light is like more immaterial and it's like sort of a bridge between matter and non matter, although light already is because a photon has no mass. So it's kind of already there. And then the final layer is which is like the, actually the ultimate reality is the absolute absolute nothingness that is so nothing that there is no is to even use 
Um, and so on the way, there are all the sephirot. And then also another um, way of understanding that just with the Jewish Kabbalah is the four layers of the soul. So there's like the animal, the intellectual, the emotional, the spiritual, and then, um, but then there are four different tree of life to represent each of those four worlds. So then there are 10 sephirot within each of the four worlds of which there are four. So there are 40 um, sephirot. Uh, really, and then um, the thing is, though, I don't know that that. Well, yeah, it is okay. Yeah, it is still hierarchical, sort of. And then um, another one, though, is the um, aethers, uh, the rising of, on the plains or through the plains. Uh, Alistair Crowley wrote a book where he went out into the desert with Victor Newberg, and they went through this ritual process where there are these calls of Enochian that are supposed to grant access to these different like tiers of consciousness. And then when you enter each aether, you have like a different experience. Um, and there are 31 of those, I believe. And um, yeah, so like you're saying, there's the, there's a bunch of different variations on this theme and you know, some of them have different numbers and stuff, but I think in a way, that could kind of be chalked up to the same thing as like the Chinese insist that there are five notes in the scale, while some Arabic cultures insist that there are 72. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? But point A and point B are still the same. Point. Different perspectives on the same object. Kind yeah, of. they're just dividing. Like, it's like, is it a, is it a meter or, or, or a yard? You know what I mean? It's just like a different metric for the same, the same thing, I think. There's like guardians uh reminds me of like cherubim like guarding the i forget the name of it basically like the garden of eden like the like etheric garden of eden uh the place where god exists in like jewish lore <laughs> yeah the flaming sword of michael is supposed to spin around and keep all the unworthy out of there but then some people say that it's actually a cia that has paid psychics at the pentagon that are scaring people away once they approach these um levels and who knows well, that's a rabbit hole i haven't really seen yet huh <laughs> interesting yeah, but uh, but yeah, I mean, that one experience that I had where I rose through the planes all the way to like the highest possible tier, I think there was definitely shifting colors along the way. Like every layer, it was like it shifted to a different color until I broke, broke through the top and then it was like absolute nothingness. And the second to last one wasn't gold, it was blue. Um, Do you remember the sequence of colors? No, but I think... Um, white light was actually not that, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it was one of the last ones was definitely, I mean, I do remember like red, there was never green. It was probably all primary colors. Um, just cause that would make sense. And I don't know if you know about this, but it may help to study uh, a little bit the, uh, color scale of the hermetic order of the golden dawn, because, by that way of thinking, it's like everything is some sort of symbolic essence. Um, so color is also vibration in some way. And so it's like a, a form of like pure information or something. Um, and so the all of these myths, too, are kind of based on these things that underlie it. And so one of the things about the Lucifer myth uh, and the reason... I, I think I'm remembering correctly that blue was the second to last before there was, um, it may have been blue, white, and then nothingness. Something, I mean, this was, you know, 12 years ago or something, so it's, it's hard to remember exactly, but. Um, Were the, you using a substance of yeah, some sort? Yeah, I smoked DMT. That's what I was thinking, it'd probably be like DMT or something. Yeah, I, I smoked a lot of DMT. Like it was like I just piled like a huge amount on a bowl of weed and just hit it as hard as I could a whole bunch of times. And and that was it was really calm considering that, you know, it was like I just lifted straight up out of my body and was just I was going through all these like 
there were geometries at first and then those kind of faded away and it just kind of became like these rooms or not rooms but just spaces that had different colors and i knew exactly what was happening you know i had like an awareness of that i was passing through these different like dimensions isn't quite quite the right word but then i kind of came out the top and i i was like okay after i mean that sort of after it was over because as soon as i started thinking i was no longer in that place of absolute nothingness but there was no time there was no desire for anything to happen and that realization is kind of what broke it you know i was like oh wait i've heard of this <laughs> and then i was like shot back down into my body you know and you haven't uh gone in that direction that far nearly that far without any substances since then or no, well kind of uh that white light that is a big part of it's called the lux also you know the lvx like you'll see it abbreviated oh. a lot in, in occult writing um yeah that light sometimes will flash like if i have like a really strong intuition or something almost like internally and i can kind of feel it a little bit like one time i actually thought i got hit by lightning because it was so bright mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, kind of. That white light aspect of it definitely has... I've seen golden light, too, before. And I've that was, a, like, eight years ago or something. And I was actually doing, like, a golden light meditation I learned from Osho. And it was just, like, way too intense. That I was just like, I don't even really understand why this is so fucking intense. And I don't want to be, like, messing with it too much. Like I kind of want to like learn or learn what's going on. Yeah, well, it, learning what's going on can be just like making up a story and accepting it too. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know that we're ever really a hundred percent sure what's going on. Yeah, I mean, now I'm a uh, a little bit more willing to just explore and to say fuck it. Yeah. So what happened as a result of this, though? Was there any kind of residual effect on your consciousness or? So I had a idea while you were talking. What do you think is the next stage in your development going to look like? Um, that is uh, difficult to think about at the moment because so many unknown uh, elements, circumstances, things that haven't been resolved yet. Um, but ideally, I guess, you know, if I'm allowed to continue, um, I think that it may all be coming to a sort of head, uh, because I feel like I've always been kind of drawn to uh, Machu Picchu in that area in Peru ever since I was a small child I kind of knew that that was there was some kind of um, you know like climax the, there yeah and so that's where we're leaving for on Tuesday I guess so you know I mean for me the thing has been that I didn't have any preparation for navigating the normal world I didn't have any of the, you know, wisdom that a father is supposed to teach. And I also had a tremendous amount of emotional and psychological damage from my um, upbringing. And so all along the years that I was figuring all this stuff out and, you know, like you mentioned how you build up all this energy and then if you step off, it's a catastrophe of epic proportions. That's what I was doing constantly. Um, and, you know, since I was building so much energy, the stepping off always um, really off. <laughs> so uh, I think this is the first time in my life where I've finally been sort of alleviated for the most part of all of that trauma and confusion. And now I have like the discipline and the willpower and the stability to actually do what I'm supposed to do. Um, so I think the next phase for me is to create some sort of um, 
artifact of all of these experiences that is able to transfer the information effectively to other people, you know. So whether that means going back and creating more music again, or, um, you know, I'm trying to convert a lot of my, my uh, live streams into books by feeding them into chat, chat GPT. The one thing that I, I have been thinking about is I don't think the isolation really helps me that much. I mean, not me personally, but the general mission that I'm on. Um, so many times I would go and play shows and then afterwards people would, you know, even if the music was wordless, they would tell me that I had communicated to them exactly the stuff that I talk about in my YouTube channel. So... You know what I mean? I think that's probably overall this entire time that I've been like stranded in South America, basically, that that was the most effective way for me to communicate. And so um, that's a little bit irritating. But, you know, I think, you know, I didn't really intend to come down here for so long. COVID basically trapped us. So mm -hmm. it was never the plan to abandon all that. And um Despite, you know, I still do think that the universe basically manages to assist you, it, but it's not like a conscious thing. It's more like um, there are structures and tendencies and conditions and circumstances and energies that you just kind of find yourself aligned with if you're functioning in the right context. Probably a better way to think about it. Yeah, it definitely exists. It's just really an an enigma for the yeah. most part. Yeah, what do you mean? In de what what definitely exists? The sort of weird... <clears throat> yeah, that sort of feedback system. Yeah, the feedback loop is definitely real. There's no question about it. In fact, just, just a few minutes before we started this conversation, uh, I was thinking like, well, one tendency that I definitely have that is consistent with Taurus is stubbornness. And I walked into the bedroom and I had just gotten a message from Enrica that said, well, our stubbornness does serve a purpose. Nothing <laughs> else, no context, nothing at all. <laughs> Pretty sure Enrica is psychic. Well, anyone that has, yeah, um, well, has their matrix shit deactivated to some extent. Um, but yeah, for sure, you know, that kind of telepathic communication between me and her happens pretty, pretty often. Um, it might work through something like morphic resonance, just like if you're playing the right tones and frequencies, the right pitch, it's going to amplify, the signal is going to be amplified throughout the, like, uh, zero dimensional space and non locality. I think and everything's gonna yeah. I think what actually happens is that it like it's there's some kind of like energy or something passing through the person and then it gets absorbed into the vibrations of the music. I don't know that it's really about like the specific tones and stuff, you know what I mean? It seems to be more about who is playing it and what they um you know, like Jerry Garcia, like he's gone, that energy that was there, you can't just like recreate it. It's, it just hasn't been on this planet since then, you know? So, uh, and that's one of the people that I mentioned that came out of a show and was stopped Brian and I and said, hey, can I tell you what you taught me about music tonight? She said that, you know, the intuitive understanding that she had downloaded while in the audience was that some, when people have attained to some certain level of consciousness when they vibrate you know and play music then um it sort of like integrates into the vibrations and goes and affects the consciousness of the people out in the audience and um yeah i mean i also i i don't know if keyboard players that's the thing keyboard players have to use tones because they're not touching anything <laughs> i don't know if um i don't know if it can work quite the same way for people that don't play uh like stringed instruments or breath instruments or something but maybe it doesn't matter maybe it's just like you're just there you know and it's just picking I've up had that spiritual experiences with the piano piano players yeah piano players. well and it definitely can uh, there are also sequences of notes and stuff i'm not saying that doesn't happen um it definitely is something that like i think fish has figured out that there are certain formulas 
um, rhythmically and harmonically and melodic, more harmonic and rhythmic that sort of release these floods of something like dopamine or, you know, but yeah, it it's is, about building tension in the right ways and then releasing it in the right ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the difference is when you do that, it definitely, it doesn't necessarily enlighten people. It's more like it, like it's like a dopamine thing. Uh-huh. It's not like the yeah. It's not like transmitting that deeper signal. Yep, that's yeah. what the big argument between Fish and the Grateful Dead always was. The fans, you know, because the, the Grateful Dead kind of resented Fish for kind of almost like the sugar rush version of what the Grateful Dead was doing or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And wow, yeah. that's a really really profound distinction that I've definitely noticed most more unconsciously. But yeah, that's uh-huh. definitely something I've constantly noticed. There's definitely a, a, a line, and you know, 99% of music is on that side and not Grateful Dead side. Yeah, communicating something. From yeah, beyond. actually, somebody somebody once said to me, you know, basically the thing, what it is, is there's the Grateful Dead and everything else. <laughs> and so, that's pre- as far as I can tell, that's basically true too. <laughs> And Fish said that too, you know, there's somebody who was like, what do you think about the Grateful Dead combinations? And the drummer said, there is never, we're not the Grateful Dead, there's never going to be another Grateful Dead, so it's just, but anyways, yeah, I mean, the important thing, I guess, is the mechanisms of it, and that's why I was thinking, you know, maybe I can do both, it's just, I, I, I underestimated how difficult I think it is, in a way, to, um, not just to understand it yourself, but getting the, the people together and stuff, it's, it's quite a task to, although, you know, I shouldn't even say that because if I had maintained my course, the universe was taking care of it for me. It's like chemicals in a Petri dish and everything just kind of slurps together. You know, the things that are drawn to each other just, <laughs> um, yeah, unless you like just stop playing along all of a sudden, I think. Yeah, but. Yeah, like you said, it doesn't have to be a difficult process. It's probably just like the wrong way to think about it. No, it's really aggravating for me to, to like, you know, have the clarity that I have now and look back on this whole crazy journey and realize that if I had just taken a deep breath and like had different parents or something, it would, <laughs> would have been it would have been a cakewalk right into my dreams, you know. I mean, I I almost did that anyways with, you know, all of the chaos. Well, and... You know the Nietzsche quote Something like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah, that's it's like the, whatever doesn't kill your will towards that highest end is going to strengthen it. And that's like a huge, it's a necessary lesson in the process in some way. Yeah, most people that you go are on this kind of path at all do not stay on it. You know, eventually they cave in and just settle down and become normal or whatever. And like, despite it all, you know, I definitely have not really fully ever deviated from it you know i don't know if i could 